Hey there, welcome to another episode of The Cutting Room Floor. This is a segment where we dig a little bit deeper into some content from a recent message here at Sunny Slope. Um, it allows us to explore some stuff that maybe we just don't get to in a sermon, or maybe stuff that is is related but sort of not directly related. And so um, it gives us some time to explore these these other topics that are of interest. We are starting the season of Advent by looking at a story in the Old Testament uh, from the book of Ruth. Um, and, and the story of Ruth is a pretty well-known story. In, in a way, it actually focuses partly on Ruth and partly on, on Naomi. And, uh, and it tells the story of how they walk this road from um, sadness and sorrow and, and suffering back into a place of fullness and, and, and abundance. The story begins, as you might remember, with uh, with Naomi and Ruth, uh, really in a in a especially Naomi, really in a place of of profound sadness and loss. Uh, she's lost her husband. She's lost her two uh, sons. Uh, she's in a place of of material need, physical hunger, and you'll remember one of the things that Naomi she says she she actually when she finally returns back to her hometown, she actually insists that people no longer call her Naomi because in her view, the name doesn't fit her any longer. She's Naomi is a name that means pleasant and her life is anything but pleasant. And so she pours out this complaint to the people in her community and, and she expresses this, this real sadness and, uh, and even bitterness about the things that have taken place in her life. I thought it might be uh, helpful to look a little bit about what does it look like to respond to people who experience this kind of loss and grief in their life? Because this is one of these places where I think we aren't always, we don't always know how to respond when people express this sort of pain to us. And I've seen it as a pastor, I've seen it over and over again. People, they, they pour out their heartache, they pour out their sadness, their anger, their bitterness, to a friend or to a member of the church, and rather than being, rather than hearing a response that is encouraging or supportive or helpful, they actually are met with responses that are less than helpful. And um, and I think I think that's I, I think that's because we don't always know what to do with with lament. We don't always know what to do with with sadness, um, and we're uncomfortable with it, and so we actually draw away from it. I've I've noticed probably oh five or six different ways that people might respond, and so I want to just identify those, and then maybe offer a couple of practical suggestions that are better, more biblical ways of meeting people in their in their places of pain. Um, one of the things that we do when we hear and when people are suffering, uh, we tend to withdraw. It's hard to know from the text, but it's possible that some of the women in Bethlehem do this. Um, Naomi comes back, she returns, and it seems that they're talking amongst each other. They're talking to each other, but it's possible that they're not directly addressing to Na uh, Naomi. And it's, again, I don't want to overstate that it's possible that that's not what was happening, but I think the text leaves room for that. That's one of the things that we often do when, when people are, you might be going through cancer treatments or you might be facing the loss of um, a loved one or you're, maybe you're having difficulty getting pregnant or you're facing, you know, challenges, loss of a miscarriage uh, or something of that sort. And you find that people stop calling. They aren't sure what to say. They aren't sure how to respond. And so it's more comfortable for us at times to just not say anything, to not do anything. We just, you know, we tell ourselves that we're busy. We tell ourselves we'll get to it at another time. and But of course, that time never comes. And so we end up withdrawing. Um, sometimes what we do is we want to correct people. And so a person comes to you and maybe they've experienced the untimely loss of a son or a daughter. And they might say something that we know in our minds to be theologically incorrect, right? In other words, they might say something like, you know, I thought God was always in control and 
I don't understand why he allowed this to happen. Like person might say that and in our minds, sort of theological alarm bells go off, right? We hear that and we say, well, wait a minute. No, God knows what he's doing. He is in control. And we respond by trying to correct their theology. We want to fix their, their error. Uh, and related to that, we we actually, one of the other things we do, so we withdraw from people, we correct their theology, or we also provide theological answers or rationale for what has happened in a person's life. And so a person comes to you, a friend comes to you, and they've lost their job. And it was a job that maybe they've really loved, and they were hoping to move ahead in the company and to make career advancement. And the company is downsized, and now your friend is out of a job, and they they come to you and they express just the the pain of that experience and the disappointment and the discouragement, and um, and we respond by saying, well, God has a plan. God intends this for better. He's got something better in mind for you, um, or we you know we you know maybe a worse response, I've heard things like, you know, especially with a, a profound tragedy, the loss of a child, and then we say things like, well, um, God must have had, uh, you know, he must have had a reason for taking your little your little girl or your little boy. Um, we might even say something like, well, God needed another angel in heaven. And and that's sort of bad on a on two levels, because not only is it insensitive, but it's also bad theology. Um, but but our impulse is is to try to provide reasons or explanations. Sometimes those explanations might even be biblical. They might even be true, right? I mean, we can say things like, well, God is working everything together for good. And, and theologically and biblically, that's true and that's accurate. But we're meeting a person's pain with theology 101. And that's usually actually not helpful in the moment. Um Related to that, another response that we have to people suffering is we want we give advice, right? We tell them, well, have you tried praying a little bit more? Someone comes to you and, and they explain to you that they're really struggling with anxiety and they're at a breaking point because they feel so overwhelmed with uh, taking care of their children at home and managing the responsibilities of getting kids to school and soccer and their kids are having maybe difficulties with other kids at school, maybe the marriage isn't going so well, and a person comes to you and they pour this out and they express their frustration, and then we say, well, have you tried having devotions every morning? Um, have we? Have you tried spending more time in prayer? Have you, tie, have you tried, you know, being more thankful? Now, it's not to say that these are not good suggestions. In fact, they can be even helpful in working through the problems and the stresses that we face. But but there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. Um, and I think sometimes what we need to focus on first is uh, empathizing and listening. And that kind of leads me to the last thing that we do that is not helpful, but but it can be helpful. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this one. And the, the last one is that we identify with people. Years and years ago when I was in college, I was making a visit uh, to a family who had visited a church and they were interested in learning more about Christianity, but they had some real struggles in their life. They had lost a child, I think, as a teenager. And the conversation drifted to the to the question of why would God allow that to happen and, and the struggles that they were having with accepting the fact that their, their son or daughter had died at a young age. And the person on my visitation team we're doing this kind of in partners, her response was to say something like, well, I know just what that's like because I, I've always had a really sore back. And um, and you could just, you know, I, I just was in shock hearing that because you could just see the the pain on the person's face that we were visiting that, that you would compare the loss of a child with, you know, a bad back. Um, it was, it, it must have been incredibly sensitive, insensitive and, and hurtful. That's a pretty extreme example, but but sometimes that's what we want to do. We want to identify with people. We want to just say, well, I know exactly how you feel. We we want to show that we have a connection with the person that's that's hurting. And 
here's where it's not helpful. It's not helpful if, if what you are doing either intentionally or unintentionally is you're trying to take the spotlight. Now you have to think in terms of the, not so much the motive, but the effect. Um, as you're communicating with the person, are you functionally drawing more attention to your own experience and to your own suffering? In other words, you sort of just picture it like you're standing on stage and this person, you know, the spotlight shining down on you and this person shares. Are you trying to pull that spotlight over to you now to talk about your experience and everything that you've gone through and how hard it was for you? And Or are you trying to keep the spotlight on that person and, and you're identifying, you're saying, you know what, that is incredibly difficult. I've been there. Let's talk about what you're going through. Let's talk about how painful this is and how sad it is. You see there, there's a difference. So if you're trying to use your experience as a way of one-upping the other person or trying to take the spotlight uh, or you're trying to sort of show that your experience, even though they're really not similar at all, you're just trying to, you know, use it to insist that you have a lot in common, then it's not helpful. But it can be helpful if it if you use your experience as a road into that other person's um, suffering. And so that's maybe where I want to go next. And I want to just kind of wrap up by giving you some suggestions. How do you, what is a more effective way of responding to a person's pain? If, if someone in your life is experiencing hardship or loss or, or just having a lousy week, how can we be good listeners? How can we care for people when they lament? And I think here's where Ruth in the story does so well because Ruth, uh, Ruth, she enters into the pain of her mother-in-law. She listens. She doesn't respond in any kind of, of, of judgment. She doesn't correct anything. Um, and maybe again, it's overstating the message of the text, maybe that because the text isn't really focusing on that. But I think you, one of the things that you learn about Ruth is that she does so well at entering into the pain of the other person. She does so well at, at um, really dying to self, right? You, she's not, she realizes that even by, by binding herself to Naomi, she's losing so much of herself in order to experience and enter into that experience of Naomi. I think one of the best gifts that we can give to people who are hurting is to listen in a and, and to be a non-judgmental presence, to hear the pain that people are expressing, to acknowledge it. You're not there, there's always a time and place to ask questions to help walk alongside a person forward, to you know, and, and even in the story of Ruth and Naomi, you, you do get the sense that there's progress, that that Naomi comes through this. She doesn't remain in her bitterness. Um, and, and I think that's important. I, and I think one of the ways that we do that is we actually allow that space for people to express that pain, to be a non-judgmental person, to try to hear and, and even ask probing questions that, um, that, that help that person unpack and, and express their, their heartache. Um, acknowledging and entering into lament is is a is a powerful way to help a person through suffering. Um, we do that by by good listening. We do that by not right away offering answers or explanations or rationales or reasons, but we do that by listening. Uh, you know, because because there's a lot wrong with Naomi's lament. Actually, like if you listen to Naomi, she she is she's sort of teetering on the edge of bitterness, and she says, "Well, God has." given me, you know, she's, he's made me empty and taken away everything, even though he's actually given Ruth to her, right? So theologically, Naomi is incorrect. But the power of lament is the ability to express that and, and for people to hear that and to acknowledge that pain, to give that space um, without correcting or giving answers or fixing what people are going through. Um, I think caring for people really does involve dying to self. It involves dying to our own wants, needs, wishes, desires, um, and it, it actually involves entering into that other person's uh, pain. Are there other suggestions? Maybe you have something, leave it in the comment. Um, if you've gone through, especially if you've gone through an experience, please uh, share what, what did you find helpful and what did you find not helpful about how people responded to you. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time on the cutting room floor. Thanks for watching.